afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Costa with The Washington Post, a national political reporter, and I'm pleased to be kicking off today's event with Mercedes Schlapp, the White House's Director of Strategic Communications. Mercedes has been serving in the Trump administration since last September and is one of President Trump's top strategic messengers. She is a longtime voice in the Republican Party, strategist, consultant, commentator. So appreciate you being here today, Mercedes. Thank you. Bob, you're only looking younger. Well, <laughs> I was on that campaign diet for a long time. <laughs> now I'm not, thankfully. <laughs> but uh, let's just get right into it, Mercedes. You're top advisor to the President of the United States, and there's a lot happening with this administration. <clears throat> the Trump administration argued today in court that the President has the right to ban all reporters from White House grounds. The, the argument made, quote, was there's no First Amendment right for reporters to be there. Do you share that view? Well, first of all, I cannot comment on the ongoing litigation at this time. If you can't comment on the litigation, what about the broader fight between the president and the press? What is the cost to our democracy? Look, as the president said, he supports the First Amendment. Um, he supports freedom of speech. I think the important thing here to look at is the fact that uh, there's a certain decorum when there is a press conference occurring or any event at the White House. And there is a matter of what is respectful to reporters, what is respectful to the institution of the presidency. And I think in that particular incident, we weren't going to tolerate the, the bad behavior of this one reporter. Uh, you know, we had a, one of our White House staffers who was very shooken up by the incident. Uh, and, and it was one of those things where I think at that point, it, there, there was action that needed to be taken. And so, you know, now we're in court. We'll see, we'll see what the judge decides tomorrow. The intern was shaken up? Yes, she was intimidated. She felt intimidated. She was very shaken up by the, by the incident that occurred. Why did the White House publish a sped up tape of that incident? Well, the tape was not sped up. It just showed that, um, it showed that, that uh, Jim Acosta basically pushed her arm away. Uh, and it was just an unfortunate incident. And again, we're not going to be tolerating the bad behavior. I think that we, you know, this president has been very transparent in talking with the press. It's been very accessible in talking with the press. Uh, in that press conference alone, he took over 65 questions from 35 reporters. And it was getting, um, when the president had said, you know, we're, we need to move on to the next reporter, uh, it, that did not happen. And it was, it was a sense of frustration, I think, that occurred that day. And, uh, and, you know, this is something that he, that this reporter crossed the line at that point. And we appreciate those questions, 65 questions, the more the merrier. But when you said we don't condone that conduct, we don't like that conduct from a reporter, how does the White House really decide what is proper conduct? And is that appropriate for the White House well, to I be think deciding was... what the press can and cannot do in this it's, country? Look, the, the press is, of course, we support freedom of the press. We want these lines of questioning. The president takes on these questions day in and day out. He has a media engagement almost daily. Uh, he's the one wanting to ans answer the questions. Uh, and so there is a certain decorum in the, in the White House. You look at a Nancy Pelosi press conference versus a Donald Trump press conference, it's a very different ballgame. The reporters ask the question. It's in a respectful manner. Uh, there was d clearly disrespect in this, in this area, and action was taken. So the administration maintains it respects the press even though it's going to court to say it can ban reporters this from the is, White House? This is part of it. We absolutely respect the press. I think that we need to have the mutual respect on both sides. But when you think about Jim Acosta from CNN, his credential for the White House grounds was pulled. Are others in the press right now being considered within the White House of having their credentials yeah, pulled? I'm not going to get into any internal deliberations that are happening. All I can say is that we, we want this to be a healthy relationship with the media and, and the, the White House. It's very clear that the way certain reporters have treated certain members on our staff, um, and with, especially with certain lines of questioning, it, it's, it's, it, it's becoming, it gets difficult, and we're not going to tolerate the bad behavior that we saw with this one particular reporter. I think the use of the word healthy is right. I mean, the press would welcome a healthy relationship, but you but just when you have 95% of the coverage for the out. president being negative, and it's a constant barrage of individuals even going and where you know that they're being completely hostile constantly to the president. It, it's, where is that healthiness? The president is there. He's answering the questions. He's being direct with these reporters. But it's hard to have a healthy relationship, perhaps, if you can't rule out that other reporters could be right now having their credentials reviewed. Look, at this point, this particular incident is the one that we're focusing on. Obviously, it was bad behavior. 
Um, we don't appreciate the fact that our White House intern felt the way she felt um, in this situation, and action was taken. We'll see Act, what the courts Well, action decide. certainly, to, I mean, the, it, but the administration is doing more. It is going to court to offer, just to argue right, it has a wide CNN scope beyond that, Jim Acosta. But they, they put forward the lawsuit, so we're obviously part of that lawsuit, which we can't comment on. Do you appreciate the concerns, though, that have been raised by many news organizations and reporters that these fights between the, the president and the press do damage institutions, do damage the country at a fragile moment for the press globally? Uh, where the press is under siege across the world? Well, I mean, Bob, you can, we can have this discussion. It was interesting. We were watching this documentary with uh, William F. Buckley and Gore Vidal back in, you know, when it was the... Best of enemies. The, yes, exactly. Called. The best of enemies. And, it, the two, and that's really where you find TV, right? The, commentar the commentators all starting that, that phase in television. And you had the reporter who would have asked the very basic question of, well, what is your position or what is your view on the Vietnam War? Or then they would go back and forth and debate, and there was this sense of decorum and conversation that would happen amongst the press and amongst the, the commentators at that time. So I think what we're looking at is that it, it has become increasingly where, when you turn on the news all the time, that it has turned from the objective media to we're going to push forward this resistance message of trying to undermine this president and undermine the administration and undermine Republicans, quite frankly. So it, it is a, it, it's a hostile environment. If, if it's, it's one way we can move and change in that in a different direction, yes, of course, that would be very good for our country and for our democracy. But at the same time, we have to allow for this freedom of speech on all sides, on the political side and on the media side. I respect that point of view. You, any American can have a view of the press as being whatever they think it is, you can call it hostile. That's your right. And, and think about but, it, the but, media has but you, changed But the administration is using moved, the phrase enemy of the people. That's on a fake pretty, news, the president has said it's well, fake news, misinformation, a, and... The, but he uses that term often. Um, to, the administration, you have to acknowledge, is also, the president himself, hostile to the press at times. The president is direct and, f direct and transparent to the press. You know exactly how he feels and what he thinks. He's answering the questions. Enemy of the people is a term right He's out of the Soviet very Union. very much as it is fake news being of enemy of the people. And that's how he explains it. He explains it as it's misinformation that's provided to the public where that is a detriment. It, it leads to aggression. It leads to hostility. And it's just, it, again, going You're back to a how we have the dialogue. What you say is misinformation, that's fake news in your terminology. Yes. And then there's real news, which I guess is objective journalism. That Look, there's doesn't always going to be opinion journalism, too, and we've seen the growth of that as well. In fact, people nowadays have different uh, ways that they get their news, quite frankly. Like those people that, you know, more lean to the left might go, let's watch MSNBC. Those who lean to the right go to Fox. There's more choices when it comes to how uh, the media um, what, how they get their news, right? What, how they process their news. So that's different than beforehand when you just simply had about three networks that we were, you know, the ABC, NBC, CBS. So it, it really is a change, a fundamental change in our society of how individuals are getting their news um, through their news. It, it, you know, think about social media and the fact that if a news story is up and what if the news story is wrong and then what happens? It goes viral and then it's the cleanup that comes afterwards. So there's a responsibility on the side of the media as well to provide accurate news reporting. Can you update us at all on the president's efforts on Jamal Khashoggi and to figure out what really happened there? Well, what we've seen so far is the Treasury Department today announced these sanctions to 17 individuals who were involved in this abhorrent killing. Uh, obviously, it's incredibly tragic what we have seen. And other, as the president said, he was going to take action on this. Turning to the midterm elections, and tone was a real issue for some voters we encountered in the suburb at the Washington Post. Looking back at also tone and race the, and the media, all topics that you have to deal with in your job, the president went after th in th three black women reporters and used language like stupid, loser, when talking about them or their questions to him in, in the last week or so. It was inside not the, about them personally. Well, is there any concern inside of the White House about this kind of language being used by the president with these women? Again, the president, I, I, I work with the president every day. He tr treats women, not me, with professionalism and uh, respects very much my opinion. 
Uh, and I, it's just telling how the president is. He's very direct. If he doesn't like your question, he's going to tell you he doesn't like your question. It's just how he is. He doesn't talk like an, uh, an, uh, as a politician would in that sense. I mean, in that sense, there's no difference as to how he would say, or, or if, you know, if he basically doesn't think he doesn't like your question, he will let you know he doesn't like your question. I'm sure he's done that to you too, Bob. Oh, he's, no, he's a tough guy to interview, tough yeah. man to interview. Yeah. The president usually wants to take it in his own direction. But I just wonder, inside the White House, your head of strategic communications, when the president uses that kind of language, what is the response internally? Does, is there just silence, or is there someone tap the president on the shoulder and say, sir, maybe use different language? How does that work? Look, the president clearly is his best communicator and is, wants to be able to deliver his message. I mean, we have plenty of policy accomplishments. We have an incredibly successful economy at this point, as we know, all across the board from minorities to women are benefiting from the direction he's taken this country on an, in, the, in the economic path. And when you look at our accomplishments and what we're doing to help minorities, help women, to help American families, to help American workers, whether it's working on our trade deals, uh, whether it's ensuring that we're putting the right economic policies in place uh, to benefit and create prosperity in the United States that lifts all Americans. I mean, that's what we're focused on. We're focused on, uh, on doing what we can to help uh, America, help the American workers, and help our families. What about for women inside of the administration? You said it's been a positive experience for you working for President Trump, but there was a, an ouster of a national security aide this week moving to a different position in the administration, Amira Rickadell. And it was unusual to have the First Lady's office issue a statement criticizing Ms. Ricardell about her position and her tenure in the White House. Yet you look back and you think the White House at other times has defended men as they've de left the White House under scrutiny. Rob Porter, the former staff secretary, defended by top White House officials. Yet a woman gets a statement from the First Lady's office and then is summarily moved to another part of the administration. What does that tell us about how women are treated I know by this White you, House? I know you might be stuck on the identity politics of women versus men, but in this particular case with the First Lady, she had an opinion about the staffer. Uh, she made her opinion known. Uh, she provides advice to the president. At the end of the day, it was the president who made the ultimate decision to uh, transfer Mira to another part of the administration. Is the First Lady involved in a lot of personnel decisions at the White House? I mean, as she's mentioned before, she has said, I give advice to the president. At the end of the day, the president's the ultimate decider. Do you think it was appropriate to have the First Lady's office weigh in in that Look, way? The, the First Lady will have an opinion, and uh, she made her opinion known in this process. And as, as I mentioned before, the President's the one who's going to decide on, in terms of personnel, which is what he did. He ended up transferring Amira over to another part of the administration. A lot of times out on the campaign trail, voters ask about the President's statements. And you look at the Washington Post fact checker, it has over 6,000 false or misleading statements made by President Trump. As a communications advisor to President Trump, what's being done to try to provide him with more accurate information? He gets plenty of, I mean, you know, he gets plenty of briefings, whether it be intel briefings, briefings from his staff. Um, you know, the president will state his opinion on these matters. You all have obviously a very biased agenda of what you all want to be pushing. And, uh, and you know, we don't, you know, as we have seen, we've seen tremendous progress under this president. I mean, you guys are determined to tear him down. And that's what a lot of, a, a lot of the hostility that we see coming from some members of the media. Well, it's not hostility. And the, the fact checker at Enterprise is to just try to inform the audience and to inform the reader. It's not a political agenda. For example, when the president makes a statement about the caravan that's exaggerated. We what, believe that the Washington Post. What's in the Post. Ca caravan? So, for example, I don't know if you have the classified information on the caravan, but go. So, tell me the number on the caravan. I, I do not have the classified. Okay. Well, let me make this very clear. So, on the caravan, for example, when you're talking about criminal elements involved in the caravan, that folks in the media have questioned. I know from reports that there's over 300 criminal criminal elements within that caravan. They're using women and children as these shields. You know what they're also doing? There's these left-wing organizations who are planning and organizing these caravans, not giving the information to the individuals that they can actually apply for asylum in Mexico. So there's information, obviously, that we're privy to that maybe media organizations don't know and, can't, and are not allowed to know because there are reports that, that we can't share. I mean, there is, I guess, a disconnect you're raising. The, the administration clearly believes it has all the facts, I guess. And in the press, we really believe we're trying to provide fact-checking of both parties, not just the Republican Party. Right. 
so the reader understands the context of information. And it just, there, do you feel that the president ever does struggle, though, with facts? I mean, Bob, the president is transparent in how he talks to the press. He mentions his opinions. Uh, and, and, I mean, at this point, I just feel that he really does his best to be able to communicate to the American people what we are working on every day in the White House. Turning to the midterms, the Mueller investigation wasn't a huge factor, but it's going to be a huge factor soon if Mueller issues his report. Today, the president tweeted, quote, the inner workings of the Mueller investigation are a total mess. You talked about how you had knowledge of classified information on the caravan. When I read that tweet as a reporter, I wondered, how does the president have inner knowledge of the inner work into the Mueller investigation? Well, that's the Department of Justice who obviously knows what's happening in the Mueller investigation. We are not involved. We've been in transparent in this process. We've cooperated. The White House has turned over 1.4 million documents. Uh, that's, that's basically where we are with that. I mean, we've, we've cooperated with this investigation. You, you said the Department of Justice is taking care of us. Has the uh, acting attorney general, Matt Whitaker, briefed the president on the Mueller investigation? Uh, not to my knowledge. Who's on the short list for attorney general? I don't have a list for you. <laughs> what, is, what, what should we expect when the Mueller report comes out, uh, Mercedes? Is this going to be total war from this administration against that report and the institution? Look, of the I'm Department not going to get ahead of any of what the report will say or do. I know as a White House, this has been going on for close to two years. We've been cooperative in the process, uh, and we've been transparent and handed over 1.4 million documents. There's been over 31 interviews uh, for the Mueller investigation. Does the communication shop have a war room plan for the Mueller report or or the upcoming again, congressional I'm not investigations? I'm going to get ahead of the investigation. Then again, as you know, the personal lawyers of the president is one that deals with this investigation. What about separate from the president's personal legal team, the congressional investigations on the horizon? What's the communications perspective on how to handle the Democrats now having power in the House? You know, we, we really, and the night of the election night, the president called Nancy Pelosi. They talked about working together in a bipartisanship manner. I know that there's going to be issues such as drug pricing and, and, and likely infrastructure uh, on the horizon. And so our hope is to have a, a healthy relationship and be able to get things done for the taxpayers of our, of our country. Uh, if they go down the path of oversight committee, and it's, you know, it's, it's going to be tricky for them. So our, our goal, again, is to stay focused on the policies and being able to push forward what the American people want, which is that of ensuring that we invest in our American workers and we invest in our infrastructure. Hey, you said the president spoke with Leader Pelosi. Has the president spoken with Senator Joni Ernst or Congresswoman Liz Cheney? Who, both of them were just elected no. to Republican leadership. I'm really proud of both Liz. I've known Liz for a long time and Joni Ernst and, and looking forward for them to be messengers on the Republican side. Uh, and, and being, being able to talk about the great things that we're doing in, in our party and what this administration has done. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if he's, if he's talked to them or not at this point. Are they going to be a, a, a counsel of counsel to him on politics and policy? You know, I don't, all I can say is that the president makes numerous calls to congressional members and, and those of us, in, uh, those in the party. Uh, he's meeting uh, today with Senator Mitch McConnell as well as uh, Senator Shelby. Um, and, uh, and it, you know, it's an opportunity to talk about the lame duck Congress, which we know is coming, coming just, uh, just uh, this week. So there's a lot to get done from now till December. Do you acknowledge the GOP could do a little better with women looking back at the election results this year? That Look, I always think as a party, um, you know, and, and it was really wonderful to listen to Barbara Lee because I think she was so inspirational in talking about how women really have a role to play in politics. You know, when I was 15 years old and I grew up in Miami, um, you know, I came from a, a, a Cuban-American fam family. My father was a political prisoner in Cuba and uh, lost everything. Uh, and, it was, you know, he was in jail for six years for, for being a freedom fighter. Uh, so I knew very much that at a young age that I wanted to get involved in politics and be a public servant. Either that or I didn't have any other talents in other, any other field. But there, uh, it was... Uh, it was something I knew that I would always want to be here to protect our democracy and protect our freedoms in America. So I take my responsibility very seriously. Uh, and so coming to Washington, uh, going to graduate school and then staying here, this is my second term time that I've been in a White House, which is unusual. Not many of us do that. Um, you know, you start to realize that uh, you, you want more women 
to be involved and so more minorities how, how, than How do Republicans do that involved. right now? How do they do You know, it? I think we have a winning, I think we definitely have a winning message when it comes to um, not to the economy in particular. The fact that we've done so much to help women, to uplift women, the fact that we have been able to lower the unemployment rate uh, for women, for minorities. You know, we know, it's about talking about the positive message and the successes. It's about, you know, for families and for suburban moms, I'm a mother of five daughters, you know, the idea of the, the importance of public safety, of, of making sure our communities are safe. I mean, we have a huge opioids crisis in our country that impacts so many communities. And the fact that this administration and the first lady in particular has made it, a, and the president have made it a priority to address um, the opioids crisis uh, and really provide the flexibility that the states need and the money and the funds that they need to, to, to be able to impact this horrific crisis. I mean, one of the issues that we see with the border, for example, is that you have, you know, they, they seized over 2,000 pounds of fentanyl on the border. I mean, the fentanyl is coming into our country at an enormous rate, and that's why we need the issue of border security is one that's important, even when you're dealing with this issue of fentanyl. And it's why we're talking, talking tough with China, because China is one of the, the biggest producers of fentanyl that, that comes into the United States. So these are a lot of the things that we're tackling. I think it's a lot of the important messages we need to talk about, healthcare being another one. The idea that I know Secretary Azar and I get to work on all these policies with those teams, um, focusing on lowering drug prices. I mean. As a, as a mom, a lot of times, and as a woman, you're, you're stuck in this middle of raising the younger kids as well as trying to dealing with aging parents. So it's how do you help, you know, mom and dad who are becoming, you know, seniors to, or are seniors to be able to, you know, make sure that their drug prices are lowered. And at the same time, um, you know, for, for your children to have the successes, you know, and have hope and not live in your mother's basement till you're, you know, until they're 30, but making sure that they have economic opportunities and something to hope for. So I'm very optimistic about the future of America and what's coming up in, in, in generations to come. What about the future of the White House, this staff? You think about the Post reporting that Chief of Staff John Kelly is likely heading for his exit at some point in the coming weeks or months. Will President Was that the story today or was it like six months ago? Because <laughs> that's the story. Is he leaving writing. soon? <laughs> no. I mean, the no, president has not great, I mean, the president has a great relationship with General Kelly. Um, the one thing General Kelly has brought uh, to the staff is, is a lot of the putting in processes in place right. when it comes to policy processes and ensuring that we're able to, you know, get, get something done from point A to point B. Point Z, and so why we had so much success with the tax reform. Well, whenever he goes, General Kelly, will the president interview a woman as part of that search process? I'm not going to go into like a hypothetical on what if, who if. You know, at this point, General Kelly is uh, is with us, serving. You know, obviously we were in the senior staff meeting today, and uh, really continue to give us great direction in terms of making sure we stay on task on what we need to get done. Day to day, you're often uh, you're on television, of course, but behind the scenes, a strategic advisor to the president. Have you ever thought about would you be willing to serve as White House press secretary if asked? I'm incredibly happy serving in my position, and I think Sarah Sanders does an amazing job every day of uh, talking to the press, making sure the reporters are getting what they need. Um, it's a tough job, and uh, and she does a really wonderful job every day in, in in making sure that we're getting the information to the reporters. So you're not ruling it out. Maybe. I, I'm not interested in becoming press Unders secretary. You're not interested. That's <laughs> I'm very. I need Sarah Sanders to stay there as long as possible. And I love. I really have the great uh, honor of not only working with her, but with Kellyanne and with Ivanka. I mean, I think between us, we have about probably 15 children, and I think just having that female support is so important because there are days that are very challenging. And you know, I know you all like kind of mock and laugh at me for making certain comments, but no, we're not laughing. No. Well, they are, but no, they. But not. here's the deal, like we're all trying to do our best, and we all try to do our best. You know, I'm trying. We're I'm doing my best managing, you know, five kids, working full time, and trying to do a good job. And I think whether you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, you know, you are doing your best to serve your country, whether you agree or not with a policy, whether you don't like a person or you do like a person, I think we've got to get to a point that we can have this very important dialogue um, where we know that we can find that middle ground to help make sure that we're doing the right things for our, our children and for, for this country. And we respect your work and respect your efforts. At the same time, you are a spokesman, a top advisor to a president who's saying things like enemy of the people. So tough questions aren't right, necessary. Right, and I answered your tough question. Sometimes. <laughs> I'm trying here. 
You're doing great. Not oh, well. We'll <laughs> see about that. Uh, when you look ahead, a lot of our stories here about the president's reaction to the midterms recently, and to be frank, most of his confidants say he's unhappy, somewhat grumpy, isolated even. You should what, go to my house. My husband's a lot more grumpier than what's your, what, grumpier how is, than. Has President Trump <laughs> lost a little bit of, of his mojo? Not after, at all. After seeing his power go Not away in the House. We were there. I was with the president yesterday. Uh, he was focused and energized. He was jovial. He had a media interview with uh, a Daily Caller yesterday. Um, very engaged, you know, focus on the G20 summit that's coming up at the end of the month, uh, focus on lame duck uh, Congress. What are we going to do there with the lame duck session uh, in terms of ensuring that we can get border security as well as moving forward on the farm bill and our nominations, which obviously has been, have been stuck in the Senate for a long time. He's, he's incredibly engaged, very energetic, very focused, positive, and uh, keeping us going. So I think uh, I, I love when they start going into the dark moods. We, we, I have this story where when they were writing like the chaos stories a while back ago. Um, I go over to Bill Shine and Sarah and I'm like, let me just, where is the chaos? Because, you know, we're so honed in on ensuring that we're able to govern and do the right. be, well, working the on tweets. the policy. I mean, vote. the all cap tweets is what. Are you surprised by the all cap tweets? No, I'm not we surprised by them. Beginning. But when you, act, when you say, where is the chaos? Well, <coughs> The, the Twitter. Did you get the tweet today where he said that we're move, functioning very smoothly? So we're, he we're, did, after going are. all caps about there Mueller for a few times. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, this is about the disconnect. I mean, you keep saying the president's fine, the president's in good spirits, and then the country, whether it's reporters calling up his friends or advisors or the country reading his Twitter account, objectively, they don't see that, what you just said I you mean, see. Well, I'm, what I have seen is a president who's focused, engaged, and, and really just doing his job and doing what he can to t talk, you know, work on the policies we need to be working on. That's what he, we're, we're focused on, and that's what I work on with him. So you all want to get stuck on moods versus good moods. I mean, we might need a moon ring. I don't know. But all I'm saying is that, you know, beyond the, for you, it's you're thinking about the moods. For me, what I'm seeing is a president who's incredibly engaged you know, he's going to California this week to weekend to be, uh, to go be with the families of the the victims of the wildfires. And it's, it's really tragic what's happening out there. I mean, there's it real is, issues happening in America. So while you're stuck on moods, well, I'm stuck on how we that, can on that point, exactly. create so did, solutions. Did, House Minor problems. did now House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy have to call the president to urge him to stop tweeting about the fires? Uh, that's not, I don't. I don't know. I, I don't have knowledge on that. So, but you're as a strategic messenger advisor to the president. I mean, what do you make of the president's initial response to the fires? Well, let me tell you, the president has was briefed on these wildfires. Obviously, we're very concerned on this wildfire um, crisis has been happening, and it's been the worst that we've seen the tragedy. all season. And the tragedy, the loss dozens of lives, of people the loss of property. I mean, acres and acres of land lost as well. Those obviously people who are missing. I mean, it's it's a, it's it's horrible to watch. He had a he had a very good conversation with Governor Brown yesterday. Uh, he spoke with uh, FEMA Administrator Brock and Secretary Zink, who, who are both out there. You know, there's obviously very, and we've been talking about this as an administration. Both Secretary Purdue and Secretary Zink have been involved on the issue of the forest management, which has been disastrous out in the west, in, out in, out west, and especially in California. And so we're looking at measures to figure out how we can deal with forest management. Um, in, in you know cleaning the brush and ensuring that these incidents don't occur because it's really devastating for these states. But can anyone ever pull the president aside when he was going off on the fires at first? He's changed his tune a bit on the fires and say, sir, there are some norms here about how to respond as president to this kind of crisis. He signed the declaration, he did. Of disaster, the disaster declaration. Um, he obviously stated his opinion about his concerns on the inadequate forest management situation that we're seeing. It's a, it's a very big concern. It's something that we have been studying and looking at for a long time uh, in the administration and, and, our, and we'll take action. Uh, and then the final question here, I mean, just to, to follow up on the fires question, whether it's Puerto Rico or the fires, does the president see so much of his job as transactional, how people are, are handling money, federal money, who's maybe trying to be mishandle funds? It, it seems trade transactional his response to crises sometimes transactional. Am I mistaken in that view or, or not? Uh, yeah, 
specific to Puerto Rico or just in general? Well, just in general, really, is transactions. Look, I think there's always, here's the thing when it comes to federal funding, there's always these large pots of money. When you're looking at disaster relief, for example, in particular, there is a lot of money put in, millions and millions of dollars put into these funds. And so the question in the case of Puerto Rico, was there mismanagement, you know, will there be mismanagement of funds? We, there was, there was so much money put into Puerto Rico to rebuild it uh, because they had a very uh, inadequate power plant because of the fact that so much money had to be in. And so, of course, he's concerned of how uh, we're going to be utilizing the American taxpayers' dollars. I mean, it's, it's, it's important. I mean, it's why he's asked uh, each of his um, agencies to look at to 5% cuts. I mean, we're seeing an increase in deficits. We want to make sure that we're able to contain federal spending, something that I think has been a problem uh, for a long time, both on the Republican side and the Democrat side. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I think this would be really interesting to just keep going, but we won't. It's just an interesting conversation, right? Um, but I really appreciate, Mercedes, you taking the time to come to the Washington Post. I know you have a very busy schedule, and to have a, a, a bit of a dialogue, it's appreciated. Thank you, and so thank you to Mercedes Schlapp.